What he's saying is that that is a picture of Israel. And what does Jesus say in the New Testament? I am the vine. I am the true Israel. Okay? Going back to the symbology in this blessing right here. He says, um, he will, uh, where is that? Um, oh, binding his donkey to the vine and his, uh, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. So maybe that's mean he's tied to the vine as he's riding on it. Whatever. I'm just trying to give you some symbolism that he is the vine, he rode on the donkey. All of this is fulfilled in Jesus. Okay, yes. next one. He washed? He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grace. Okay, we talked about that yesterday and I, I talked about it a second ago and here I, I'd forgotten that this was in here. It's in the book of Revelation. The wine press of God's wrath, oh, right? Yes. The blood going 180 stadia or 180 miles, which is 1,600 yeah. stadia, which is the length of Israel. The blood is going to be flowing in Israel when this battle occurs at the Battle of Armageddon. It's going to be, it says the blood will be as high as the horse's bridles for 180 miles, the length of this entire valley that runs through Israel. Okay, but that goes back to Isaiah. Okay, and as I said, I think it's Isaiah 64. And this is how, 63, thank you. This is how we know that this does not pertain to the church, that the church will be out of here. This is Isaiah's prophecy of something coming. And then it's fulfilled in the book of Revelation, which was prophesied all the way back here by Jacob. It says here, I love this verse. I read it yesterday and I'm happy to go back to it today because it makes my hair stand up. It's so beautifully written and yet it's so horrible in what it signifies. Yes. Who is this who's coming from Edom? which means red, it's the land of Edom, red, with dyed garments from Basra. Basra means the sheepfolds, so that's just what it means. The one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Okay, in the New Testament I believe he's mighty to save. Anyway, somewhere else he's mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the wine press? This is speaking to somebody and they're asking, why, why are you all all red. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone and the, from the peoples no one was with me for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments as I have stained all my robes for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. Meaning the redeemed of Israel. This is Isaiah not prophesying about spiritual Israel. He's prophesying about the people of Israel. The church is certainly going to be out of here before this happens, which means that that fulfillment in the book of Revelation must be speaking the tribulation period about Israel, not about the church. We have to be out of here. We're going to be gone. The temple is done. The last person is converted. Okay, but this all goes back to what we're reading right now. These prophecies that Jacob made are all being fulfilled. In Nobody can tell me that the Bible is not perfect. And it is. it does not reveal itself in such a way that we can know. People that make errors in this just haven't done their homework. It's all right here. Jacob said it. Isaiah prophesies it. John says it's done. Even though it hasn't happened, that's called prophetic perfect. When something is proclaimed as already done, even though it's future. Prophetic meaning uh, there's something coming. Perfect meaning accomplished. So when you see a prophecy in the Bible as if it's accomplished, when the prophet speaks it, that's a prophetic perfect prophecy. It will happen exactly as God said, and in his mind it's already done. That's what that means. Okay? So, um, go ahead. Twelve. His eyes are dull from wine, and his teeth white with milk. Okay. His eyes, this one says, are darker uh, than wine. Okay? The one that you have makes it look like he came drunk. Exactly. You know? So, and once again, this is translator's preference, but I much prefer the uh, New King James Version because his eyes aren't dull from wine. They're actually darker than wine. Okay. He, and, you know, that makes sense because he's of the, uh, the Semitic uh, background, which they have dark eyes. And Okay, his eyes are darker than wine. His teeth are whiter than milk. Okay, go ahead. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon. Okay, now Zebulun is mentioned again where? In Isaiah where? I think it's Isaiah 9. I'm going to turn there, and if it is, um, uh, it, it's the prophecy that later Zebulun was... Okay, here it is, 9-1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, and when at first he lightly esteemed 
uh, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of the death, upon them a light has shined. So what he's saying is in the past years, from the time of Jacob's blessing, they received their inheritance and God lightly esteemed them. He didn't, he didn't you know, uh, give them the attention that he gave Judah. He didn't give them the attention that he gave these other tribes, Ephraim. But at some point in the future, Isaiah says that they are not going to be lightly esteemed. They are going to be where the Lord himself walks and the people will see a great light. So we're reading about Zebulun and we also read about Naphtali. These are two people that are just kind of, you know, he blesses them, but they don't get this great blessing and they really are not mentioned elsewhere until that time that Isaiah says they're going to have a great reward. Okay, go ahead. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. What's that picture? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Well, it, it, the next verse will tell you what it, he's lying down. Um, before we go on Zebulun, it says he, he shall be a haven for ships. That tells you he's going to be on the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. And we can see all of that as it's divided up later. Somehow Jacob knew this when he prophesied it. But anyway, go ahead. Verse 15 will okay. explain. When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulders to bear burdens and became a slave and forced labor. Okay, um, this one says he became a band of slaves. Anyway, it looks like they got lazy and they just, they, 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 they had a good land, it was abundant, and they just lay down, as you said, they're in peace and they're just taking it easy and eventually they just sold themselves as slaves uh -huh. because of their, their you know, it's Laziness. like, there you go. And, you know, th that... They weren't watching. They right. Weren't watching. And, and those people were taken away as slaves in Assyria. But as I said, there is a remnant saved from every tribe. Okay? Yes. This is a general uh, announcement about these sons. Okay. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. Okay, they believe, I've, I've heard this before, we don't know, but um, Dan is not mentioned in the list of tribes in Revelation 7. It says Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Dan isn't mentioned. They are mentioned somewhere else in one of the genial or, or uh, tribe listings. But I have heard this said, and you know, we simply don't know, but people like to say this is what's going to happen, even though it's future and they don't really know that, that uh, the, uh, maybe not the Antichrist, but the false prophet is going to come from the tribe of Dan. How they would know anyway, who knows? You know, because we don't know who's in what tribe anymore. The Lord does, but we don't. But anyway, um, uh, Dan, what they did, if you know the story, they were given an allotment, and uh, eventually they went up on the way north. Uh, they decided to settle in the very north, which is called Dan, which Mom and I have been to. It's in the very north of Israel, right on the border of Lebanon. You can actually see Mount Hermon there with the snow on top of it over in Lebanon. You can see Syria and Lebanon. Anyway, um, they, on their way up to, to subdue this land and to uh, get the people out and to uh, get their inheritance, stopped by a guy's house. I can't remember his name right offhand, but this guy was um, in the tribe of... I want to say Benjamin, I may be wrong, I'm, I'm just forgetting this right now. But anyway, he hired a Levite to be his personal slave. And so this guy was, I, I mean his personal priest. So his priest is, he's a priest to one guy. And this guy has um, uh, an idol set up, an ephod, and uh, this guy ministered to him. And he's obviously not following the Lord, he's following idols. But Dan comes along when they're heading north to get their land, and they went into the house and they said, you know, uh, this guy has his own Levite. He's got his own uh, idol there. This, I think it was 1,100 shekels of silver. And he said, um, they said to him, uh, they, they said to the Levite, why don't you serve us? You can be a, a priest to the entire tribe instead of to just one guy. And the guy's like, bonus. So he grabbed the, uh, the idol and he left with Dan. And then the guy went running after him saying, hey, you stole my thing. And Dan says, listen, you just shut up and go back because you don't want to be harmed. So the guy walked back home with his tail between his legs without a priest and without his uh, idol. What it's in the book of Judges. Okay. And uh, anyway, I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that I'm not quoting it perfectly, no, but... Um, but it's not the one that was destroyed because they uh, raped and uh, murdered one of the... They, they murdered what? I thought Dan was the one that was destroyed. 
Dan was the tribe that destroyed, it was destroyed when um, they raped and murdered. Um, no, that was Benjamin. 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 Yeah. I, they went down to 600 people. Um, uh, no, it's not, um, it, it's earlier in there. It's before that, um, not 13. Uh, we'll see if we can find it real quickly. And if we can, it's a fun story, but uh, I, I'm forgetting. It says here at the beginning of the thing, now in Israel there was no king. 17, and it, seven, 17. 17. Okay, so it's later, not earlier. Okay, 17. Um, Let's see here. We'll read this. I'll just read it real quickly. There was a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Micah, that's his name, whose name was or Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and of which you put a curse, he had stolen this money, this silver from his mom. And his mom says, whoever did this, curse him. So he, he heard that and he's like, whoa, I don't want to be cursed. So he says, um, I stole it. Okay, even saying it in my ears, here's the silver with me. I took it. Okay, and his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So now she's pull, withdrawing her curse and saying, bless you, because I got my money back. So what is? So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver my, from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. So here she's invoking the name of the Lord. And in the same breath, she's saying, we're going to make a molten image, which is against the law of Moses. So you can see how fickle these people are. So they make the, uh, they make the uh, silver. Thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took the 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith. And he uh, made into a carved image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. Then the man, Micah, had a shrine and made an ephod and a household idol. So he has a shrine. He's got idols. He's got an ephod. He's got all this junk in his house. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, this is the theme of the book of Judges right here. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Last sentence of the book of Judges repeats that. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem and Judah of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and he was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem and Judah to stay wherever he, he could find a place. And he came, came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem and Judah. And I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell here with me and be a father and a priest to me. And I will give you ten shekels of silver a year plus a suit of clothes and your sustenance. So he's getting ten shekels of silver. He's getting clothes and he's getting a place to live in free food. So he's like, hey, bonus, found a place to live. So the Levite went in. The Levite was content to dwell with the man. I'm going to skip down there to uh, chapter 18. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, once again. And in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself. Okay, So they're looking for the inheritance. Um, uh, I'll go down to verse 3. While they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite because they had been living down in Judah and they recognized this guy. So they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What have you to do here? He said to them, Thus and so Micah did for me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. So they said to him, Please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we will be is prosperous. So he's inquiring of God while he's a priest of a shrine image. It, it, it's just The whole thing is just totally convoluted. Um, uh, and the priest said to them, go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. So the five men departed because they're just a, a, a five people right now that are going out to search out the land. Um, they saw the people who were in the land, how they dwelt safely, and the matter of the Sidon, Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land to put them to shame for anything. They went as far as the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anybody. So they went back down to their tribe in Judah, and it says here... Um, uh, they went back and there were 600 people, oh, 11, and 600 men of the family of the Danites went from uh, there, from Zorah to Eshtael, armed with weapons of war. And uh, then we're going to go down, they got down to verse 14, then the five men who had gone out to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Brethren, do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image, and a molded image? Now therefore, consider what you should do. So they go in there and the 600 men armed with war, um, weapons of war, who were the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Then the five men who had gone out to spy out the land went up, entering there. They took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. I mean, it's, it's obvious what they're going to do. So it says, when these went into Micah's house, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priest said to him, what are you doing? And they said to him, be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man 
or that you would be a priest of the family and a tribe of Israel. So I won't go on. I, I told you the rest, how the guy came running after him, all that. But right from the beginning of the establishment of their inheritance, Dan had compromised. They were completely compromised even before they had received their inheritance. 